Hello everyone, I'm super excited to be talking to all of you today. My name is Jenny Curry and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Modern Canna Labs in Lakeland, Florida. We are a certified marijuana testing laboratory, which is otherwise known as a CMTL, and we test medical cannabis products in Florida to ensure that they are safe for human consumption prior to them making it to market. The analyses we test for include, but are not limited to, things like potency, terpenes, homogeneity, pesticides or agricultural agents, so fungicides, uh, growth regulators, pesticides, all of that good stuff, uh, residual solvents, metals, water activity, moisture, mycotoxins, and microbials. And while I could spend uh, hours <laughs> discussing all of these analyses and why they're important and what goes into them, today's focus is going to be on total yeast and mold analysis in cannabis flower. And during this presentation, I will briefly describe total yeast and mold. I'm going to discuss different regulations that surround this analysis. We'll touch on some of the different methodologies that are available to for total yeast and mold testing. And we're going to review an experiment that our laboratory performed. Finally, we're going to look at some future work that our R&D team has on the horizon that relate directly to this subject matter. So to start, what is total yeast and mold? And total yeast and mold counts are going to be the number of colony forming units of yeast and mold that are present in one gram of sample. And these quantitative results are commonly reported as CFU per G or the colony forming units per gram. And with yeast and mold, there's tons of various microbes that can exist. However, some of those most common ones are Aspergillus, Penicillium, Candida, Sporodiabolus, Pichia, and Fusarium species. This is not all of the possible organisms that can be included, however, and that's one of the reasons why total yeast and mold testing can be difficult. When you are measuring the total amount of something that can be so many different living organisms, you really have to find a method that will allow for the right amount of selectivity and specificity. So what you don't want to happen is you don't want to use a method that's only going to allow one species of yeast and mold to grow, but you also don't want to use a method that will result in microbes other than total yeast and mold being quantified. And so for example, with uh, some of the plating media that's available, it allows bacteria to grow in addition to yeast and mold. And if that happens, the results could be skewed high and it can lead to an over quantification of what's actually present in the sample. Additionally, there are organisms that exist in cannabis that are known to be microbes, which are viable, but not culturable. And this means that it is yeast and mold that cannot be grown easily in a controlled setting. However, the organism could exist in products and it could be dangerous depending on the characteristics of that microbe. So if it's a pathogenic species, it can be dangerous, but we may not be able to grow it or culture it in a lab. And again, you know, this adds another layer of difficulty to measuring the true amount of total yeast and mold in a sample. So now that we know what total yeast and mold is, let's talk about how this analysis is used across the country. As a cannabis lab in Florida, we are required by law to test all final products for total yeast and mold. And the regulatory limit for this analysis is 100,000 colony forming units per gram. And that is in flour. And so these limits will change depending on the product type. However, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on flour. So the regulatory limit I will be referencing throughout the presentation is going to be that 100,000 CFU per gram. And while this seems high, especially when you look at this chart and it shows the different regulatory limits for total yeast and mold across various states, and you see things like 1,000 or 10 or 10,000, uh, it is something that growers and producers in Florida really struggle with, uh, especially during the summer months. And that's ultimately going to be due to the amount of rain and humidity that we have in Florida. We live in a swamp and honestly, there is yeast and mold everywhere. <laughs> so when you take a closer look at this chart, you can see that there are 27 states that currently require total yeast and mold testing in cannabis and they have regulatory limits for this analysis. So some states are gonna have extremely low limits while other states like Florida have higher limits. And these limits are decided at a state level because cannabis is still federally illegal and is a schedule one substance. And so that's why we're seeing so many variations. 
you can see that the states have to make their own decisions. So they're going off of food or other regulatory bodies and they're taking suggestions from that to develop the limits in their state. And so you can also see here though that there are several states with uh, marijuana programs, recreational or medicinal, that do not even require total yeast and mold testing. And so some examples of that are gonna be, you can see California, Washington, Oregon, and Missouri all have cannabis programs, but none of them require that total yeast and mold testing. So, you know, the biggest question that arises out of these varying regulations is should total yeast and mold testing be performed in the cannabis industry? And my personal opinion on this matter is that I believe we should move away from total quantification tests such as t total yeast and mold and instead move towards testing for more pathogenic species those things that are known to be harmful and known to be dangerous let's keep the total yeast and mold testing because it's a good indicator for how clean the process was but let's not make that determine whether or not a product passes or fails now that we have established what total yeast and mold is what the limit for total yeast and mold is, and the fact that it is a required analysis in Florida, we're gonna look at the various methods and technologies that can be used to perform the analysis. For total yeast and mold testing, there's gonna be three prominent method types that are used. So the first is gonna be culture plating methods. The second is quantitative polymerase chain reaction or QPCR methods. And the third being cultured most probable number or MPN methods. And over the course of the next several slides, we're gonna discuss each of these technologies and how those methods work. The first method that I would like to discuss is going to be culture plating based methodologies. And for this type of method, what the laboratory is doing is that they're attempting to grow organisms of interest on a specific media in order to determine an overall count. So once the colonies grow, they can count those colonies and determine the concentration of microbes that are present. And in this process, what's going to happen is the laboratory is going to weigh up a specific amount of sample and then they're going to add the appropriate buffer that's needed to grow the microorganisms of interest so you can see in that first file there we have our cannabis flower and our buffer it is an important thing to add that the amount of sample that's weighed and the buffer that is added is going to be used to determine an initial dilution. And so once that initial dilution is determined, the laboratory is then going to create three serial dilutions, and those serial dilutions are what will be plated. And with this, uh, with plating-based methods, it's the best protocol to do a minimum of three dilutions when determining a total count. And the reason for that is your higher dilutions may not have enough growth or your lower dilutions may have too much growth. And so by doing those three, you can really catch an overall picture of what's going on. So once that sample aliquot has been added to the plates at those various dilutions, the plates are incubated for a specific amount of time and any microbes that are present will begin to grow. At the end of the incubation period, those colonies that grew are gonna be counted and the average of the three dilutions will be used to determine a final concentration. So theoretically, if you're doing dilutions, the number of colonies should decrease as the dilutions get bigger. So in this diagram, you can see that that first plate has 16 colonies, the second plate has eight colonies, and the third plate has four colonies. So if the assay is working correctly, this decrease would indicate that the serial dilutions were increasing by a factor of two from one plate to the next. With plating methods, it is important to recognize that there are a lot of different types of plates, medias, um, agars that are available and that can be used. And so on this slide, I have listed out some of these different plate types. So the first thing we have here are our agar plates, which are gonna be sterile Petri dishes that will contain a growth medium that has been solidified with agar. And in some cases it has other nutrients or antibiotics added to it as well. And so four of the most common agar plates and the ones that we used in the experiment we're gonna discuss later in this presentation are gonna be DRBC, Sabdex, PDA, and PDAC. 
Next, we're gonna have Petri film plates. And those are plates that have been pre-made and that contain a culture medium uh, that, and a water soluble gelling agent as an indicator that will assist with the enumeration of the colonies uh, that grow. And so for this type of plate, there are specific plates for different microbes of interest. And for total yeast and mold, we have rapid and non-rapid. So the rapid plate is really gonna, the only difference is gonna be that the colony growth is gonna occur in a shorter time period than what we'd see on those non-rapid plates. So the incubation times for those are going to be different. And the final plate type I would like to discuss is going to be the membrane filter plates. And these are smaller Petri dishes that are similar to those culture Petri dishes, um, but they contain a nutrient pad that has the proper culture medium present, but it's been dehydrated. And so what happens is when the sample's added, it will disperse evenly across the plate, it'll rehydrate the media that's needed, and then those organisms can begin to grow. And though there are several different types of these plates, the one we're gonna reference in this presentation are gonna be compact dry plates. So it is important to note that different plates may need different growth medias for the initial dilutions and will also require different amount of sample to be added to the plate. So agar plates, which we discussed first, can only have 0.1 mil or 100 microliters of sample added, while the Petri film and the membrane filter plates have one mil of sample added. And so that is ultimately gonna affect your in dilution and what you're doing in your sample prep. The next method that I would like to discuss is gonna be qPCR or quantitative polymerase chain reaction, which involves isolating the DNA of interest and then mixing it with primers to amplify the segment of interest in order to identify the microbes of concern. But before being able to do any qPCR analysis, the DNA from a sample must be isolated. So to do this, a specific amount of sample is gonna be weighed and a specific buffer will be added. And then once that sample and the buffer have been mixed well and homogenized, a portion of the sample is gonna be transferred into an Eppendorf tube and that tube will be placed in a centrifuge. And what that will do is it will allow all of the cells to be spun down to the bottom of the tube and a pellet is gonna be present. Then we're gonna take a lysis solution and we're gonna add that to the pellet of cells. And then this will be incubated for a set amount of time. And what this will allow to happen is those total yeast and mold cells will be broken open so that DNA can be accessed. And so without using that lysis, you can't get into those cells. So you can't pull the DNA out of them. Once those cells have been lysed, they are then transferred to a 96 well plate like you see here and they're mixed with a magnetic binding buffer. And so what this binding buffer will do is it'll attach to the DNA and it's gonna prevent it from being lost during the rest of the process. So the supernate, which doesn't stick to those cells is gonna be removed and then the DNA will be rinsed with ethanol um, to remove any extra particulate that may, may be present. So once that DNA has been fully isolated, an elution buffer will be added, the DNA will detach from the binding buffer, and then it can be transferred to a new well that now has only that purified DNA present. Once the DNA is purified and isolated, qPCR analysis can be performed. And for this, a master mix is created that contains primers that are specific to the analytes of interest. So in this instance, what we will have is a primer for total yeast and mold and a primer for cannabis DNA. The reason for including the primer for cannabis DNA is that it's going to serve as an internal control and it will prove that the DNA extraction process worked. So if at the end of the process there is not amplification of the cannabis DNA, it's safe to say that that extraction may not have worked. And if that's the case, then the samples should ultimately be re-extracted because there's no way to ensure that that sample was actually free of the contaminant that was being measured. It may have been present, but we may not have gotten that DNA and extracted and isolated it properly, which prevented us from seeing it. So once that uh, master mix has been prepared, it and the purified DNA are mixed at specific concentrations on a 96 well plate. And once that mixture is homogenous, the plate is sealed and loaded onto our PCR instrument.
Once loaded, the instrument will warm up and then it will begin undergoing cycles of heating and cooling. And as this happens, polymerization will begin to occur between the DNA that's present and the primers that were added to the master mix. So if the DNA segment that matches the primers is present, it will bind together and will begin reproducing exponentially. This process will continue um, and the polymerization will eventually result in probe degradation, which will allow a fluorescent signal to be generated and the DNA to be amplified. The absorbance of this fluorescent signal at the end of the run will allow us to determine the concentration of microbes that are present and then they can be measured and quantified. Finally, we have the most probable number or MPN methods. And this method is also culture-based, so in some ways similar to plating. However, the principle behind how it works is slightly different because you're not actually growing colonies when you're using this method. Instead of looking at those individual cells quantitatively, this method relies on specific characteristics such as turbidity or acid production to predict the number of growth units of microbes that would most likely exist if colonies were grown. So in this method, serial dilutions must be performed in order to confidently measure the concentration of microbes present, again, something that's similar to what happens when you're plating. When applying this method directly to cannabis, it's going to be the same prep as the other methods and similar in where you're going to weigh up a sample at a certain amount and then you're going to add a growth media to that to create initial dilution. However, it's a little different because from here you must create a secondary dilution that is going to remove any interferences that may be present. And for this, it's important to note that because this method can be affected by the pH of a product, the majority of that matrix must be removed in order to prevent any false positive or false negative results. Cannabis is naturally acidic and as such, the change in pH that's gonna happen when you have a large amount of matrix could skew those final results. The nice thing about performing this method nowadays compared to in the past is that there is a product available that will allow the serial dilutions to be created automatically by having a single card with a certain number of wells that are various sizes. And you can see in this diagram you have a set of 16 and each set of those has different sized wells. So one set being small, another set being medium, and then the final set being large. Basically, once you've created that secondary dilution that contains the sample in the buffer to remove the matrix, it can then be loaded into the card and then the card will be placed in an incubator for a specific amount of time. And over the course of that time period, any microbes that are present will begin causing a physical change to the wells that can be measured and quantified. So if you look at this zoomed in version of the card on this diagram, you see that five of the large wells, eight of the medium wells, and eight of the small wells underwent a physical change that indicates microbes are present in those wells. So now using this information and a conversion that will allow you to go from most probable number to colony forming units per gram, the laboratory can determine how many microbes are present in that sample. Now that we have explained a little bit about each of the various technologies that can be used, I would like to focus on a comparison of the various plating methods. So as I mentioned earlier um, on a previous slide, there's a lot of different options of plates that are available. And when laboratories are presented with all of these options, it can become difficult for them to decide which plate to use. And some of the common factors that are gonna impact a lab's decision regarding a specific plating type is going to include things like the incubation time, the ease of use, and the expiration timeline for materials. However, another factor that we see laboratories using to determine which plate type to move forward with is the results that are being obtained. So if there's one plate type that always is gonna yield a lower result, labs may choose to use that option because it will help reduce the number of failures. One thing that the cannabis industry is currently plugged with is lab shopping. And what is happening here is producers are choosing to work with laboratories who can get them passing results or who can get them high potencies. And ultimately this is extremely concerning and it could prove to be detrimental for the industry. So us as a laboratory who prides ourselves in the accuracy, reproducibility and legal defensibility of the results that we produce, 
we knew that before any decisions could be made regarding plating and which method to use, more investigation was needed into the processes. Now, you may be thinking, why were we asking these questions and why did we want to compare multiple plating methods? Ultimately, with so many different options, we really wanted to be able to determine which method was the most accurate. So the state of Florida briefly at one point discussed the potential of moving to plating methods only for total yeast and mold. And if that were the case, we wanted to be prepared. We wanted to know which plate would give us the most accurate results and which plate would be the plate we would use if that were to happen. So for this specific study, we really chose to focus only on plating. However, you will see in a later slide that we have future work plan that is going to compare several different technologies. So looking at how different plates compare with qPCR and compare, compare with most probable number. Plating is the gold standard in the food industry, so we really thought that this process would be a fairly easy one. We quickly learned, however, that that would not be the case and that plating methods need to be looked at more closely. And one of the big reasons why we began calling plating methods into question was due to discrepancies that we were seeing in values for certified reference materials, otherwise known as CRMs. And what these are supposed to be are standards that have a certified value. So there should be one value and that value should be what you can obtain no matter what. However, on this certificate of analysis that I included here, you can see that there are two certified values. And so one of those results is using Petri foam rapid yeast and mold plates, and the other was using Sabdex agar plates. And in this instance, the Petri film result yielded a count of 152,000 CFU per gram, while the Sabdex plate had a count of 423 CFU per gram. This means that the results being obtained using Sabdex are more than 2.5 times greater than the Petri film result, which raises quite a few questions and makes us wonder which of those two results is more accurate. Are they both acceptable? How does plate choice affect products on the market? Will Petri films always get lower results? And so on. And with all of these questions in mind, our team wrote up an experimental design that would hopefully allow us to answer some of these questions. We are going to cover the experiment more in depth over the next several slides. However, first, I want to address what our experimental goals for this project were. So first, we were looking to analyze cannabis sample using different types of plates, and we wanted to include several different agars, petri films, and membrane filter plates. Next, we wanted to assess the reproducibility of each method, both individually and against one another. Third, we hope to see how the non-homogenous nature of cannabis flower really impacts that total yeast and mold testing. And finally, our fourth experimental goal was to calculate true incubation times for each of the plating methods. First, let's go ahead and talk about our sample prep and the design of the experiment. And for this project, what we were doing is looking at three unique samples. We looked at a ground flower sample, a whole flower sample, and a minis flower sample. And so the difference between minis and the whole flower is going to be that those minis were small popcorn sized buds, while the whole flower was the hardy large buds, and those normally contain a much larger amount of trichromes. So each of these three samples were weighed a total of five times, and then each of those aliquots were prepped at three dilutions on all the plate types that we were using. And I'm going to review those preparation procedures and discuss the plate types that we specifically used over the next few slides. In addition to preparing the individual aliquots, we also used one aliquot for replicate preparations. And to do this, we took the same aliquot and prepped it five times at three dilutions on all, all the plate types. And what this allowed us to do was determine the reproducibility of the method when the same exact aliquot is used. And it really helps determine how much homogeneity or lack thereof uh, homogeneity really impacts the data. This is a repeat slide from one that I shared earlier in the presentation, but it lists out the different types of plates that we were using as part of our experiment. So you see here we had four agar plates, so the DRBC, Sabdex, PDA, and PDAC. We then used two different Petri film plates, so the rapid yeast and mold and the non-rapid yeast and mold. And finally, we used a single membrane filter plate, which was the total yeast and mold compact dry plate. 
The important thing to note about these different plate types is the amount of liquid that can be transferred onto each one and how that will impact those quantitative results. So for the agar plates, you can only add 100 microliters of sample. Uh, that's the maximum amount of liquid that can be added, whereas the petri film and the compact dry plates can have a mill of liquid added to them. And this means that the agar plates are at a 10 times greater dilution if the same starting material is used. So in order to prepare all samples in similar dilutions, this needs to be considered during plating prep and these dilutions must factor into those final calculations. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you exactly how we handled this and how we prepared the dilution schemes for each of the different plate types. This slide may be a little overwhelming at first. However, I really hope it can do a good job of depicting and explaining our plating preparation processes. For each sample, we started with one gram of ground homogenized cannabis and we weighed that into a 50 mil conical tube. To that, we added 19 mils of triptych soy broth or TSB and vortexed the sample together. And this creates an initial dilution of 20X. So you have your one gram of starting material to a final volume of 20, there's that 20X dilution. From here, we transferred two mils of the 20X solution and we were sure to avoid the cannabis material and made sure to grab only liquid. And that's a really important part of this step is you don't wanna transfer a lot of those trichromes over. And we transferred that into a new conical tube that contained eight mils of TSB. And so this creates a 5X dilution. And when you add that 5X dilution to the 20X dilution we already did, we now have an overall dilution of 100X. From here, we did two 10x serial dilutions to create that 1000x, and then from the 1000x, another 10x dilution to create the 10,000x dilution. As I previously mentioned, we wanted to keep the dilutions as similar as possible, but to do this, we needed to make a little bit of modification, and that's based on how much liquid could be added to each of the plates. So for this, our agar plates were prepared at final dilutions of 200X, 1000X, and 10,000X, and the petri film and membrane filter plates were prepared at 100X, 1000X, and 10,000X. To create the agar dilutions, we transferred 0.1 mils or 100 microliters of that 20X dilution to the corresponding plate. And this gives us a 200X dilution. And that's because it's not a one-to-one -one ratio that we're transferring. We're transferring 0.1 to one, which is an additional 10X. So a 20X times the 10X gives us that 200X. We then repeated this process and added 0.1 mils of the 100X and 0.1 mils of the 1000X to their corresponding agar plates to get those other two dilutions. For the petri film and the membrane filter plates, uh, we needed to actually transfer one mil of each of those serial dilutions to the plate because it is a one-to-one -one ratio because we can add that full one mil. And these plates are represented in green, so you can see here that we simply transferred one mil of our 100X, one mil of our 1000X, and one mil of our 10,000X to those corresponding plates. Once all plates were prepared, they were then placed in an incubator at 26 degrees, where they remain for a total of 120 hours. During the 120 hour incubation time that I mentioned on the previous slide, we pulled the plates uh, from the incubator every 24 hours. And what this allowed us to, to do was to take images of those plates and then we could document how the plates were changing throughout that incubation process. So when were the colonies appearing? How were the colonies growing? When were more colonies appearing, etc. And by doing this, we were able to establish true incubation times for each of the different plates that were used in the experiment. And we define the true incubation time as the time at which new colonies no longer appeared on the plate. So those colonies could grow in size, but we didn't want to see any more of them appearing. And on the next slide, I will show why this true incubation time is so critical for obtaining results that are not drastically under quantified. The table on this slide lists out those true incubation times. So as you can see, the minimum acceptable incubation time we saw for total yeast and mold was 72 hours, and the maximum incubation time we saw was 96 hours. And by looking at this in cannabis flowers specifically, the laboratory was able to determine how much the matrix impacted the speed at which those colonies grew.
of this, we saw four plates, the compact dry Petri film rapid yeast and mold PDA and Sabdex plates that needed the 72 hour incubation. However, we did see three of those plates needing 96 hours, that being the Petri film non rapid yeast and mold, the PDA C and the DRBC plates. Last slide probably left you wondering why we needed to establish true incubation times and Ultimately, the reason is that the methodologies that are available are very ambiguous and they do not necessarily apply directly to cannabis. So if you take the Petri film rapid yeast and mold plates as an example, the methodology for these plates states that you need to incubate the plates between 48 and 72 hours. So most cannabis labs are going to see the part that says 48 hours and they're not going to ask any more questions. This industry operates based on quick turnaround times and our clients are constantly awaiting their results. So if a lab can find a way to legally cut corners and a vendor protocol says that a 48 hour incubation will suffice, there are going to be labs who will opt to only incubate those samples for the minimum required time. However, the issue that arises with this is that cannabis is different than water, pharmaceuticals, and even vegetables that are sometimes tested for total yeast and mold using these plates. There is a lot of matrix interference in cannabis, and sometimes these interferences can lead to delayed growth on the plates. So we really need to ensure that the speed at which these samples are being processed is not impacting those final results negatively. And as you can see uh, in these pictures and in the table here, the results would be drastically under quantified had the laboratory attempted to count and report results for total yeast and mold at only 48 hours. And you're seeing that the average is going from 44,000 CFU per gram to 166,000 CFU per gram between that 48 and 72 hours. And this is gonna be the difference between a product failing or a product passing for total yeast and mold based on Florida regulations. The next important fact that the study revealed was that there is a lack of reproducibility between the various plate types. On this slide, we're looking at aliquot C from sample 0607, and we are looking at both the DRBC plates and the SABDEX plates. So for the DRBC plates, our, those are going to be our plates in pink. They had a value of 32,000 for the 200x dolution and a value of 130,000 and 220,000 for the 1000X dilution and the 10,000X dilution respectively. The SABDEX plates, which are in yellow, yielded a much lower result. And these were done at those same three dilutions, but we were seeing 32,000 at the 200X, 79,000 at the 1000X, and 150,000 at the 10,000X. And when you average both sets of dilution, so looking at DRBC, you're getting an average that is over the regulatory limit at 127,000 CFU per gram, while the SABDEX is yielding a result of 87,000, which would be below that regulatory limit. Again, this creates confusion and it puts labs in an uncomfortable position. Do you use the SABDEX plates, which yielded lower numbers, thus in turn making your clients happier, or do you err on the side of caution and use the DRBC since it produced values that are higher? And which of these two values are correct? Are they both correct? And is the product safe regardless of this variation between the two plate types? And ultimately, more questions than answers were obtained as a part of this experiment. An additional observation that was gathered during the experiment was that there may be suppression at low dilution. So if you look at the plates and the table included on the slide, you can see that the 200x values are much lower than the results for the other dilutions. And if those values are considered as part of the average, it's going to result in that final quantified value being skewed low. If you include something that is much lower, it's going to pull your average down. So aliquot C and aliquot A are both below the regulatory limit if the lowest dilution is factored in. However, if you take this out, now only aliquot A has a value that's less than the 100,000 CFU per gram regulatory limit. And, you know, in this sample, there is even potentially some indication that the proper dilution scheme would not start until a 5,000x dilution and potentially increase up to a 100,000x dilution. 
And this is based on the fact that it appears as though there may even be some suppression occurring at that 1000x. So theoretically, if dilution schemes are correct, then each of those final results should be about the same. However, on this sample, we are seeing an increase of almost two times the number of microbes between that 1000x and that 10,000x dilution. And this indicates to laboratories that they may need to be doing some sort of quick and dirty test that will allow them to determine the best dilution range for each sample. And if this is something that's not feasible because of the slow growth of microbes or because of the complexities of what we're working with, then laboratories may need to start including more than three dilutions when preparing cannabis samples. If they do this and the lowest dilution is experiencing suppression due to the concentration of microbes that are present, then the laboratory is gonna have other dilutions to include in the average and we won't just be including two numbers. The final observation that was noted during the experiment was that there's a lack of sample homogeneity and reproducibility even from the same aliquot. And the plates on this slide are Petri film rapid yeast and mold plates for that sample that was plated five times from the same aliquot. So theoretically, this means that all of those results should be duplicate since the sample is being prepped from the same exact starting material. It's coming from the same exact tube. We're weighing up a gram and we're transferring out our dilutions five times from that same exact starting material. However, you can see that this even yielded very different values. And three of those results are below the regulatory limit at 50,000, 90,000, and 80,000 CFU per gram. However, there are two above the regulatory limit at 210,000 CFU per gram and 110,000 CFU per gram. And again, what this is doing is posing questions about whether plating is an effective method for determining the quantitative amount of yeast and mold present in cannabis flour. And people will argue a lot oftentimes that plating methods are much less complex than some of the other technologies. However, they're also susceptible to more bias in a way due to the number of colonies being present being counted individually. So what one microbiologist may consider a colony, another may not, and vice versa. And ultimately, at the end of the day, total yeast and mold cannabis testing is a long way from being a methodology that can be backed by concrete evidence for any technology that is available. There is definitely a lot more research that needs to be done, and labs need to be asking these difficult questions in order to move us forward in this industry. As a review, I would like to quickly summarize the different observations and conclusions that the laboratory gathered over the course of the experiment. The first is going to be that the lack of homogeneity seen in cannabis flower can make determining an accurate quantitative result for total yeast and mold difficult. The second is that the use of different agars or medias can lead to variations in the numbers and types of organisms that can successfully grow, which can change your final result. The third being the dilutions used during that plating process may impact those final calculations. And fourth being that the incubation time for each type of plate is matrix specific and the laboratories really must consider that when determining what time is the proper time for incubation prior to processing client samples. And finally, one thing that we did not review on any of the previous slides, but I do think is important to mention is that the use of internal controls must be considered to ensure that samples are being prepared properly. And this is a benefit of qPCR technologies and it allows for that internal control to be measured. And what it does is ensures that the DNA from the product was extracted successfully. And ultimately, if feasible, we need to figure out how to add an internal control to other technologies so that it will help the laboratory have confidence in their preparation procedures, which is then gonna lead to more confidence in the results that they are reporting. As I mentioned briefly on a previous slide, more work is needed to be confident in the data that's being produced by various plating methods. And as such, our laboratory has some future work on the horizon that will allow for more in-depth validation of the different total yeast and mold technologies. And in the near future, the laboratory is planning to compare plating methodologies to other technologies such as qPCR and most probable number methods.
And additionally, the laboratory would like to measure total yeast and mold counts in irradiated cannabis flower. So as a lab that operates in Florida where the humidity is high and mold growth is rampant, we see irradiated product on a regular basis. However, not much research has been conducted regarding the impact that this process has on the microbial cells and what method modifications may be needed to quantify those cells accurately. Our laboratory also plans to have several of the colonies that are being cultured on the various plates sequenced, and we hope that that will help determine exactly which microbes are present and culturable. And similarly, we may attempt to do the same with the DNA that's extracted via qPCR so that we can see how the different species compare to one another. And finally, an important caveat that most people fail to remember is that we need to figure out a way to ensure that the dangerous yeast and mold such as botrytis and powdery mildew, which are common in cannabis flower but are not normally culturable, are being detected and included in the quantification of the total yeast and mold content. With that, I hope you all learned something new through this presentation and that I was able to provoke more discussions regarding cannabis testing, especially for total yeast and mold. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation and please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. My email is jenny.curry at moderncanna.com and you can also follow me on LinkedIn by clicking the link on this slide.